And I'd like to recognize Dr. Greg Podgorski, too. He was a great mentor and coach in helping prepare me for this presentation. And I'm happy to see all of you, especially the young faces here. So if you're 12 years old or younger, raise your hands really up high. If there's any babies, have the parents raise the hand. And how about 18 years and younger? OK, well, this presentation is really for your generation. That's because your generation is going to be facing a lot more serious threats related to climate than the older generation. And also, your work in prodding the older generation into action is going to be important, OK? So the hope is that these generations are going to be working together. But let's get into this and talk about a topic that causes a lot of anxiety. It's a complicated topic about diet. It's also um, a complicated topic of climate and climate change. So the main question that I want to consider tonight and try to unwrap some of the science about is this question. Is there one best diet for your health and also for the health of our planet? Really an important question. The UN has a panel called IPCC, the Intergovernmental Plan, uh, Panel on Climate Change, and they release the most authoritative reports, most um, scientific, the collection of scientific data on climate change. And this cover here is from the most recent report just put online in August on climate change related to agriculture and food. And I've taken a lot of information from that report. You can easily find it online. From this report, the news seems grimmer and grimmer, but we also have to keep hope that we can change our lifestyle, we can change the path of our leaders, and many things to make progress. Well, climate change is accelerating at a rapid pace from the poles, uh, both poles to the tropics on all continents and oceans. Uh, affecting all countries, and especially effect, affecting the most poor and indig indigenous populations on marginal lands. Many of these scenes are familiar, the, the melting of the ice caps that are changing the ocean in profound ways, changing the way, changing the sea level. You've ever all heard about the threats of sea level rise uh, threatening uh, coastal cities, but also changing fundamentally how currents move in the oceans, changing the chemistry of the ocean, the salinity um, of the ocean, uh, the acidity of the ocean. On the right is an effect in the Great Barrier Reef of the heat and acidification killing off huge stretches of the Great Barrier Reef, obliterating the, the beautiful and wonderful ecosystems as pictured on the left. Uh, this is a recent report, actually in this week's newspaper, about a study about the heat blob of the Pacific Ocean. This is a large mass of warm uh, temperature that has affected the fish populations and has killed over one million birds because this particular bird, the common mirror, must get half of its weight each day in fish. How many of you eat? half of your weight each day and whatever you eat, you know. It's probably way less than that. Oh, okay. There's a couple of hungry, hungry students here running around. Also on land, increasing heat and drought and, and weather are affecting agricultural lands. The lands that are hit first are the more marginal lands and a lot of the, uh, what we call the, the, the developing south, the southern hemisphere. And in indigenous populations, such as this Hopi farmer living on marginal lands in Arizona. Even wealthy farmers in California, the, the vineyard growers, and people living in cities, even, even those breathing air in San Francisco, are affected by the widespread fires in California. Fires whipped up by drought and increasingly strong winds. In Australia this year, the fires have affected over 10 times the amount of land that, were, that was burned in California. Uh, these firestorms actually altering the weather. And extreme weather is also 
an important factor affecting agriculture throughout the world. This is a scene from my homeland, the Midwest. I'm from Kansas. And increasingly severe storms throughout the grain basket of, of our country have affected agriculture with severe storms and flooding. And in 2019, over a million acres of productive cropland were damaged by floods following these storms. Throughout the world, climate change is creating climate refugees throughout the world, fleeing areas of drought, of severe weather, of, of failed crops. And this large and increasing stream of migrants is really going to cause a lot of political instability throughout the world too. So let's shift in talking about food and the UN report. This is a, a cover page on, the, on this UN report on climate change that gives a really startling statistic that 23% of the greenhouse gas emitted comes from agriculture and the production of food. So this is a very serious and complex problem. It's gonna take a lot of people working together to make progress. It's gonna involve working together with farmers and ranchers. We're going to have to work to change government policies regarding agricultural subsidies. So it's not just going to certain producers and not others. And also it involves each of us as consumers of food. We're all part of this equation, all part of this problem. So first let's consider how does food contribute to global warming? There's three important greenhouse gases that are involved. First is carbon dioxide, then another carbon compound, methane, and then a nitrogen compound, nitrous oxide. Okay, so I wanna go through four major ways that food and agriculture contribute these greenhouse gases and why they're important. First of all, we have to consider is the destruction or the burning of the tropical rainforest, actually forests everywhere, to make way for pastures, to make way for palm plantations, etc. So when forests are burned down, particularly in the tropics, this releases a huge amount of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. It also reduces the amount of forest that takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and fixes it. Methane production by animals in the digestion of plant materials is a serious concern too. But also it differs by the kind of agri agriculture and by the kind of cow. So on the right of this picture right here, this is a, a cow from India that's used more for work, for pulling carts, for pulling uh, agricultural equipment, and for milk. So the cow from India produces just about half the amount of methane that a western cow on a feedlot fattened for our plates. Other animals produce gas too. These smaller animals like sheep and pigs, even humans produce gas, okay? So I had a professor of mine that said, the human digestive system is really just like a big fermentation vat that produces gas. If you don't produce gas, you're not healthy. Just be discreet about it. <laughs> also, methane comes from the degradation of large amounts of manure in a low oxygen environment. So bacteria are converting manure to methane, but also flooded rice fields. And this is a new one on me when I was getting information for this. Flooded rice fields throughout Asia. Also, there's flooded rice fields in the US too produce a large amount of methane. That's because in the flooded rice field, there's a very low oxygen environment. The bacteria there that breaks down plant material and also the manure from the animals produces a lot of methane. And finally, farm machinery, burning a fossil fuel releases carbon dioxide. The nitrogen containing fertilizers in the soil, especially as soil warms up because of global warming, and increases the bacterial activity that changes the fertilizer into um, gaseous uh, nitrous oxide. Well, animals are critical, not only in agriculture throughout the world, but also in various cultures. 
for food, for drink, for fiber, etc. And so we really need to work harder and provide more funding for research on sustainable and regenerative agriculture. And many colleagues here at USU are involved in this work in sustainability and investigating how to regenerate agriculture, how to build carbon, put carbon into the soil, and how to re reduce the release of these gases such as methane and nitrous oxide. Okay, let's go back to the other side of the equation, the consumer side, okay? And the anxiety that we have in looking at our plate and wondering how our diet may be affecting the planet. So it's time for a quiz. You know, professors do this all the time for the students. So I have a quiz for all of you. I want you to consider these four possible ways to reduce the carbon footprint of your diet, okay? And I want you to think about ranking them from top to bottom, from most effective thing to do to least effective thing to do. So first of all, composting your waste, taking it out to the compost pile. Next, cooking over cleaner stoves, making less smoke. Eating a plant-heavy diet, more plants in your diet. And last, throwing away less food, okay? So think about that for just a few seconds. Rank those from most effective to least effective, okay? You're not being graded on this, okay? I'm just gonna ask you. How many people think that composting your waste is the most effective way? Raise your hand. Okay, some on all sides. How many think cooking over cleaner stoves, not making as much smoke, is going to be an effective way? Okay. How many think eating a plant-heavy diet, more plants in your diet? Oh, I'm seeing more hands there. Okay, lots of hands. How many think they're just throwing away less food? Oh, there's quite a few hands there too for these last two. You guys have been studying this, I, I can tell, okay? Okay, here's the answer. The most effective way is throwing away less food. That's something all of you can do. How many of you threw away food today? Well, no one is gonna admit that. Oh, someone admitted it too. I think I probably threw away a little bit too. Well, a, a group called Project Drawdown creates a metric, creates a way of trying to understand how big a deal that is. So if everyone in the world threw away less food, over the next 30 years, this would be equivalent to taking 511 million cars off the road. That seems like kind of a strange way to think about it, but it's just a way of comparing these different ways of, of doing this. Uh, okay. So it is shocking to consider, and this is from the UN IPCC climate report, that about 30% of our food is wasted globally. Here in the US, we do a worse job than that. About 35% of our food is thrown away, and most of that is by the consumer from the plate at your home, from the plate at the restaurant. So this is the number one thing that all of us can do. It's shocking that food waste alone is a cause of 10% of the greenhouse gases. And it's important in addressing this issue that all interventions, all sorts of things are done, and 10% is a huge amount. Second on that list was eating a plant-heavy diet. Okay, that came very, very close, 479 million cars, if you can imagine that. So let's talk about a plant-heavy diet, okay? The same UN report says that by adopting a balanced diet featuring, featuring plant-based foods, we can take major steps to fight climate change. So let's just try to unwrap that a bit more, okay? This is another quiz, but it's pretty tedious, so I'm just gonna walk through it. You don't have to answer it yourself. In this diagram here, there's several menu choices for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so the point of this quiz is to see what the impact is of your different choices. 
So let's just go through and look at what might be a typical American meat-heavy diet, okay? <clears throat> so that's eating bacon and eggs for breakfast, and then burgers and fries for lunch, and steak and potatoes for dinner, okay? So the people behind this calculated this and came up with this being a high contributor to greenhouse gases. The people who eat like this contribute more than 40% of the total diet-related greenhouse gases, okay? Well, there's a greener choice, and that's these greener arrows right here. So if you eat fruit and yogurt for breakfast, and then for lunch have a pita wrap with hummus, and for dinner, tofu, vegetables, stir fry, and rice, okay, yum. Then you're on the low end, okay? So people that eat like this contribute less than 10% of the total greenhouse gases, okay? So first thing you can do is not throw away so much food. Next is you can eat more plants, okay? Now this rankles a lot of people, okay? So be prepared for pushback from your parents, from your teachers, from the politicians, from social media friends, okay? So let's look at this a little bit deeper, okay? So this chart, is a list of foods. Each one of them contributes the same amount of protein to the diet, 50 grams of protein. And what the bars indicate is that to produce 50 grams of protein from beef, this then emits almost 18 kilograms of CO2. Okay, so beef is at the top of the list. Okay, if you go to lamb, you cut that in half. Okay, so just by going from a beef burger to a lamb burger, you would cut your greenhouse gas emission by half. If you step down to farmed uh, shrimp, not much of a change. Going down to cheese is another half. This is for the same amount of protein, okay? So we've gone down from, from beef to cheese, a 75% reduction. Now, Dr. Jeff Broadbent will be talking about the flavorful cheeses he makes. And you'll be happy to know that if you eat cheese protein rather than beef protein, you're really making a big dent in the carbon budget in reducing that. Um, dropping down to pork, farm fish, poultry, eggs, this red line here then gets to vegetable protein. Okay, so for 50 grams of protein from, from tofu, beans, and nuts, there's a very, very small contribution here. But is plant protein the same as animal protein? Will you be less healthy if you eat plant protein versus animal protein? That's what a lot of people think. That's what a lot of people will tell you. So is this saying that you should become a vegan and never eat any animal food? This might cause a lot of even more anxiety among people, okay? Staring down at that radish. Okay, here's another busy slide. Okay, so if you became a vegan, compared to the typical Western diet, you would reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by 45%, almost cutting it in half if you became a vegan. But what if you don't want to become a vegan? Okay, what if you want to become a vegetarian still have and not kill animals but eat animal products okay so by going vegetarian and have, including eggs including milk uh, you can reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by 30 percent okay if you're partly replacing meat and dairy with plants that is having more of a plant heavy diet you can do the same 30 percent reduction if you're just replacing beef and lamb with other meat you can reduce it by 20%, okay? So just think of these as different steps you can take to make an impact in reducing your food-related greenhouse emissions. Okay, now the big question, will I be less healthy if I eat more plant foods and less animal source foods? Not to worry, okay? So the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is the world's largest professional organization of nutrition and food professionals. 
they've produced a policy statement that says vegetarian vegan diets are healthful, they're nutritionally adequate, and they may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. That's a lot of good stuff, okay. So vegetarianism, and veganism, plant source diets, these are dietary patterns, okay. So I really want to stress the word pattern, the whole picture, okay, rather than just focusing on individual nutrient or individual food, because this really gives us a lot more insight, we can see a lot more effects if we consider the whole dietary pattern. And I love this quote. This is from a textbook I use in my class, Food Politics, by Marian Nessel. She's a prolific blogger and author at, at New York University. She says, the problem with nutrient by nutrient nutrition science, that means taking a really narrow view, one nutrient at a time. Or the problem it, is that it takes the nutrient out of the context of food, okay? It takes food looking at individual foods out of the context of diet, and it takes diet out of the context of lifestyle. It's really important to consider the whole dietary pattern, but also the lifestyle factors around that if we want to make some improvements in our health. And the, and the whole question tonight is to what dietary changes can we make that improve our health and also improve the health of the planet? Okay. so. In considering dietary patterns, one important thing, that I, one interesting thing that I found is looking around the world at who has the healthiest dietary patterns in the world, okay? So the first part of that is just trying to figure out, well, who lives the longest? So it's quiz time again, okay? So your next quiz, who lives the longest? I want you to think about ranking these countries from longest lived to shortest lived. So just think on that for a second. Maybe you know someone in these countries. Maybe you live in one of these countries. Wow, this really caused a lot of murmuring, huh? Okay, quiz time. How many people think that people in Greece live the longest? Okay, how many people think people in the USA live the longest? <laughs> USA number one, come on. Okay, you guys have been doing your homework. Japan, oh, okay. How do you know that? Oh, it's all over. How about Costa Rica? Costa Rica, anyone from Costa Rica? Anyone from Japan? Anyone been to Japan? Okay, all right. All right, here's the rankings. Japan ranks number two in the world, just behind Hong Kong, okay? Then we drop down to Greece as number 16. Costa Rica and Central America. People there are more longer lived than the United States. U.S. ranks 37th behind all Western European countries and many others. You know what country is right next to the U.S.? Any guess? Mexico? No, but actually close. Cuba. Cuba is next to the U.S. Uh, Costa Rica has one, spends one-tenth the amount per person on health care as the U.S. So what can we learn about health and lifestyle? Yeah, question? Do you have a question? Who's in first place? Who's on first? Okay, the Japanese are the longest lived. Okay, about 88 years. Oh, in the whole world? Oh, Hong Kong is number one. I think it's because they're quite wealthy. There's a lot of trouble going on. Okay, let's talk about the blue zones. The blue zones are the longest, the documented longest lived populations in the world. And these blue zones provide clues, okay? So I selected those countries 
uh, you know, Greece, Costa Rica, uh, Japan, and the US. Because within each of those countries, there are small populations that are even longer lived. They have extremely long lived people, okay? So let's, let's look at these. Here's Okinawa, Japan. In the Mediterranean, Ikaria Island in Greece, the island of Sardinia in Italy. Here's Costa Rica in Loma Linda, California. Anyone here from Loma Linda? All right, well, you know what's going on in Loma Linda. We'll get to that, okay? Okay, let's just talk about the blue zones. What, what does blue mean, okay? Well, demographers and epidemiologists were looking for the longest lived populations. They found that in Sardinia, the island of Sardinia, part of Italy, there is a location shaded in blue here of extremely long lived people. So they made maps, they colored it with blue ink. And the next one they did, they also colored it with blue ink. And they had a, wor a worldwide map of these blue dots. So they called these the blue zones, okay? These are defined by the percent of people born in, the, in that area, the percent of people that lived to the age of 100 years, okay, the centenarians. And so these have become known as the blue zones. National Geographic has done a lot of videos, a lot of articles about this, and the author, Dan Butner has a whole organization called the Blue Zones Organization, okay. This is a picture of a 100-year-old woman in Okinawa foraging for sea vegetables on the seaside. Okay, the common characteristics of these very different blue zone populations are these. Having a plant-based diet and eating in moderation. Having daily low level of physical activity. So they're not running marathons, they're not uh, jumping off the cliffs, they're in pastures, tending their sheep, they're walking all day long, they're working on their farms. It's low level, constant physical activity. They have purposeful living and spirituality. Many of these are religiously based communities. And they have tremendous social connections with family, friends, and other people in their community. So I wanna go through and tell you some of the characteristics of these blue zones. And really think about what you see in common between the diet and lifestyle. So here are the Okinawans. They have a saying called, oops, sorry, called hara hachi bu. Anyone speak Japanese? I don't. This is translated as eat until you're only 80% full. How many of you young folks only eat until you're 80% full? Awesome, there's some people that are doing that, okay. Okay, so what this suggests is the cal uh, marginal or small amount of calorie restriction, restricting somewhat, just not overeating, may be healthy. Okay, the seniors in Okinawa have one-fifth of the rate of heart disease and some cancers as um, Americans. These are diseases that affect 75% of Americans over age of 75. The sociality is really important too, sharing meals together with, not just with family, but with community members. And the diet of the Okinawans is the, the most extreme or the most different um, from us and the other blue zones. In the 1950s and 60s, the Okinawan diet had 70% of the calories from these purple potatoes right here. Very important in the Okinawan diet. And the protein came, this is carbohydrate, okay? With rice, that is a 85% carbohydrate diet. No keto diet there, okay? Tofu from soybeans is the main source of protein. The Sardinians, the, island, the Italian island in the Mediterranean, again, have this lifestyle of constant, low-level physical activity. Okay, it's a mountainous region, okay? Men and women are walking up and down the mountains. You know, we have mountains nearby, but there's not a lot of people walking up and down the mountains. We're mostly here in the valley, okay? There's also the habit, the, the pattern of enjoying meals together, this sociality, okay? And here's the blue dot, here's the blue zone in Sardinia. 
The Sardinian's diet is almost half whole grains from wheat and barley, which they make whole grain, um, naturally leavened bread. Uh, they herd goats and sheep, and sheep, sheep and goat milk and cheese, feta cheese. Now the sheep feet cheeses are an important part of the Sardinian diet. Okay, they're not vegetarians, but they have a lot of diverse, healthy vegetables in their diet. You can see this colorful plate with olives, garbanzo beans, uh, figs, etc. This is the kind of plate that you might think about. I, uh, everyone should have gotten a little card that has examples of plates. We'll get to that, but I want you to think about how the plates of different people may look across the world. <clears throat> These are photos from the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. It's a small region, mountainous region in Costa Rica with extremely long-lived people. This is a picture of a woman named Panchita. You can find videos of her and her life on YouTube. This picture is at 100 years old. At 100 years old, she's out chopping wood. An update of the video shows her at age 108. By this time, she's blind, but she's cognitively very aware. And every day, her son, who's a young man of 90 years, rides his bicycle several miles to come visit her every single day. I mean, can you imagine this kind of healthy lifestyle, healthy longevity? The, the diet in Costa Rica is much uh, simpler, okay, based on whole grain from corn, from the tortillas they make, with rice and beans. Um, this is a picture from a remarkable book called What the World Eats. Has anyone seen this book? It has these amazing photographs of families in different parts of the world and showing their food budget for one week. Okay, so here's a, a family from Guatemala showing this uh, rich array of vegetables and of grains. And this kind of traditional diet is really under threat. The Blue Zone diets are going away because of globalization, the spread of modern processed foods, the undermining of traditional agriculture. So it's really important to consider how these traditional life ways may be enhanced, preserved, because we can learn a lot from that. We can become a lot healthier if we can incorporate some of these patterns of eating. Okay. Now, someone from Loba Linda knows a lot about the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists are a Protestant denomination that has advice on lifestyle, advice on diet, that being promoting vegetarian diets, okay? So here's an example of an extremely long-lived blue zone population that probably shops at stores not that different than Lee's or Smith's, Although it's in California, so they have a lot more fresh produce, but we can get a lot of that too. The Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda outlived their fellow citizens by five to 10 years, okay? And even on top of that, these are healthy, active years, okay? It's not just lingering in a wheelchair or something like that. These are healthy people. They have strong connections through their faith community. And it's just a suburb outside of Los Angeles. So who would have thought that outside of Los Angeles is a community of some of the longest lived people in the world? You can see the activity here. Here is a centenarian, a hundred year old man taking his daily dip in the pool before he's going on to then eat this healthy meal of vegetables, whole grain breads. Over half of the plate is fruits and vegetables. How do you get a diet like that? How do you squeeze half of your plate into, or prepare half of your plate into fruits and vegetables? Okay. So these blue zone diets are very, very different from one to another. What's common between them? Okay. They have largely plant-based diets. They don't exclude animal foods. They just eat it in smaller quantities. They have a limited amount of animal source foods. They have a wide variety of foods, and they have minimally processed whole foods, not much junk food, not much fast food, okay? This advice sounds very similar 
to that of the popular author Michael Pollan, whose dietary advice is simple. Eat food, referring to real food, not junk food, okay? Not too much, mostly plants. I wanted to throw in a human experiment done in the United States. This is a, a clinical trial, an ethically done clinical trial to try to reduce high blood pressure in people with hypertension. The people designing this trial looked at the literature and thought that it was compelling that veg people that are vegetarians had much less of a problem with high blood pressure. But they thought that we're not going to get our patients to become vegetarians. Can we do some kind of study taking a lot of the vegetarian good stuff and put it in a study comparing a vegetarian-like diet with some meat to the standard typical diet? What they found was really remarkable, that within two weeks, this DASH diet, this stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Now, if you're under 12, under 18, you're probably not worried about hypertension, okay? But from our studies in Cache County, in the Alzheimer's study, the Cache County Memory Study, hypertension throughout life predicts the state of your brain in late life, okay? So this is something that you want to think about. Your parents are probably thinking about it more. Your grandparents are thinking about it even more, okay? But in this diet, this diet reduced blood pressure in a two-week period the same amount that medication did. This doesn't mean that anyone should be stopping their medication, but it means this is a really powerful way to control blood pressure, which is a main contributor to cardiovascular disease. Okay. Oh, let me go back to the yellow line here. This includes eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Has anyone ever done that here? Anyone? How did you do it? What did you have? You know, I asked my uh, university students this. Some of the dietitian students have the assignment of going on a DASH diet. None of them told me that they could do it. They said, well, I just had baby, I ate baby carrots all day long until I was sick of them. Well, that's, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to look at the card that you have in front of you and think about a plate like this. This is from Health Canada. It's the Canadian National Health Agency. Uh, the USDA has a similar plate, but what this shows is having half of your plate in colorful fruits and vegetables. This is a picture of a plant-based diet. Okay. See, there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of color. The more colorful you can have, the better. That indicates more healthy plant compounds, more vitamins, et cetera. And a quarter right here is from proteins. You don't see a big giant steak or burger right in the middle, but meat is there just in smaller quantities. It's also with other sources of protein, beans, uh, yogurt, tofu, et cetera. And then a quarter of your plate with whole grains. If you don't like wheat, try oats. If you don't like oats, try quinoa. There's a lot of choices. But the important thing is that you have whole, unprocessed food. There's a lot to choose from, okay? On the flip side is the Harvard School of Public Health version of this that has more information. And I think it's cut off, but I think on your card, there's a website where you can get great information, you can get great menu plans, great recipes that are healthy and very interesting. Okay, well I hope in this time, in this presentation, that you've found that there are many ways to eat well for your own health and for the health of our planet. Okay, first thing to do, don't throw away food. Minimize your food waste, okay? Before you try to Talk your parents, talk your brother and sister into changing their diet. Don't throw away food. That's the biggest thing you can do. Okay, next, shift towards a plant-based diet. There's a lot of steps that you can take to do that. 
and then compose your plate, like in the picture, like in the card that you have, with minimally processed whole foods, okay? But changing your diet, and thinking about climate change, that is only a beginning, okay? There's much more work that's needed to address climate change in many other areas. But your diet and your food and thinking about agriculture is an important step, okay? Other things you can do, join a climate action group, okay? Organize, act, and for those that are 18 and older this year, you can vote. If you're younger than 18, you can do things too. You can campaign. Yeah, you can campaign. You can educate yourself. You can talk to your teachers. You can talk to people in your community. You can join up with one of these groups. On campus, there's the Sunrise Bear River group. This is the Sunrise student group. They have a table here, and you can talk to people outside. There's also representatives from the Citizens Climate Lobby. This is a bipartisan group, okay, trying to bring together people on all sides, all ends of the political spectrum to consider a proposal to tax carbon, okay, that costs money, but then give away, give back to the people a dividend from this. It's a real progressive way of thinking about this. Okay, change your diet at the beginning, much more is needed. Oops, I'm going backwards. Okay, that's all I have to say, but I want to say one more thing. Before we get into questions, I want to give the younger generation the chance to talk first, because the older people usually do all the talking, okay? So if we can start off with younger folks, your comments, your questions, I'd love to hear it. Thanks. Can we uh, thank Professor Munger, please? Okay, everybody, I think we're ready for questions. And what we're going to do, okay, this, this box over here is more than a box, it's a microphone. And so whenever you've got a question, raise your hand and I'll toss it up. Ready? You good catch? Cool. Talk into the box, please. The box? Yeah. Raise How? Just like that. There we go. Why is eating meat bad for you? Why? Why is eating meat bad for you? Why is meat? Well, I don't think it's good or bad. It's all in the amount, okay? So eating lots and lots of meat, well, I guess there's two ways to think about this. One is how it affects the earth and the climate, okay? So on beef, beef production creates a lot of gases that go into the atmosphere that promotes global warming, okay? There's other choices that are better. Lamb, pork, chicken, in terms of eating meat. What about fish and turkey and eggs and stuff? That's good stuff. So fish is on down there. Eggs have the most complete and digestible protein. Eggs are good to eat too. In the old days, or back in the day, people were afraid of eggs because they had cholesterol in it, okay? So raising cholesterol in your blood is not such a good thing. But the cholesterol in eggs don't have much of an effect. Other fats do. So, so there's a lot of good choices. So things like fish, eggs, and um, chicken and turkey is, is fine to eat as long yes. as you don't eat it all the time? Right, yeah. You know, it's good to eat a lot of different things, okay? What do I do today? I want to throw that. That's a cool thing. Or Greg, I guess it's, it's Greg's toy, okay? Or, throw it? You? Okay, you throw it to me. It's not, it's not a soccer ball. I guess you got to throw it. Okay, coming at you. All right. That is cool. Um, how is uh, eating a plant-based diet, how, how does eating a plant based diet help the environment and uh, how is it healthier than meat? Okay, that was the whole subject of this lecture. Eating a plant-based <laughs> diet. <laughs> plant, eating more plants, shifting away from meat is better for your own health, okay? But how is it better for my it own health? It helps you 
reduce your risk of diseases. You know, for, you're not going to be able to really see it as a young kid. It may, like in the DASH diet, it may reduce blood pressure. It may reduce the, blad, the bad um, cholesterols in your blood. It gives you lots of vitamins, lots of minerals. There's a lot of other less described healthy compounds in plants, okay? Animals that are grazers out in, out in nature select from a wide variety of plants to get the healthy nutrients, healthy plant compounds, okay? Yes? Um, I'd like you to address how, like, weather and climate affects availability of food. Like, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, that looks like a really beautiful summer meal to me, but for me to eat that kind of fresh food in Cache Valley in the middle of winter, you know, like not only is it more expensive, but then you're also looking at where those vegetables and fruits came from and, and what about the carbon footprint of that? So I'm kind of like trying to think of, well, the balance and then the practicality of feeding a large family on, you know, like, organic, fresh, <laughs> all of that. So I'm, I'm really curious. All of those places, all of those blue zone places were places where they have, I'm assuming, year-round Yeah, no, no winter like we have right, here. Right, right, and, okay. so, and preserving food and all of that. Yeah. And, and not to mention the fact that when winter comes, I really like beef, <laughs> you know? Whereas in the summer, I'm like, yeah, I'll just have a salad. I don't want anything you know, that heavy. So, okay. so the main part of the question is, yeah. in this season and in winter, what can we do that's affordable? Okay. That's a, yeah, well, this, this is where this is actually the fresh. good side of food processing comes in, frozen foods. Okay? Okay. So actually, I love frozen blueberries opposed to the so-called fresh ones you can buy at the market that come from Chile because they, mm -hmm. they taste better. Right, right. They're grown you know, in the US, they're frozen. Canned foods also, as long as there's not added sugar and salt, mm -hmm. that's a great choice. So this is a question a lot of the dietetic students deal with in um, counseling other students. There's a lot of food insecurity among college students even. You, know, you might think that they're all wealthy and eat well. So these are the kinds of advice. So uh, dried foods, frozen food, canned foods, in terms of fruits and vegetables. Right. The whole grains, you can get all right. around, no problem. Uh, the meats, beans, you know, beans, they're a year-round thing too. Right. But you're right about the colorful side of the plate. That's a challenge for people that live in frozen environments. Right. And doesn't the nutritional value go down with food processing, including freezing? Well, it depends on what kind of processing you talk about. But just frozen foods, no. Okay. And, and okay. even canning, okay? Really? The milling of wheat to make white flour, that's the kind of processing that is removing nutrients. So I think that's maybe kind of news or advice that a lot of people don't recognize is that frozen and canned foods can be good. Just read the label. That's yeah. important. And, and then uh, along with that, like, is, isn't there some sort of like reason why when, when winter comes, we do crave like heavier, more meaty based Something with vitamin D or I don't know, maybe I'm making it up. Maybe I'm looking for a justification. Comfort food. <laughs> maybe you've been outside yeah, and is it cultural it's cold is it? and you're shivering and you need more calories. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, I, I, I know what you mean. I like a warm bowl of soup or stew. Yeah. You know, comfort but in the food. summer, give me a salad and I a smoothie. I must confess, you know, uh, we even make meatloaf, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was, I'm not a vegan. I'm not a total vegetarian. I think it's great to, well, my choice, our choice, is to have occasional meals. I'm from Kansas City, barbecue capital. When I go back to visit my mom, you know, I go to Arthur Bryant's uh, barbecue place where, <laughs> yeah. So it's all in the amounts in terms of the meat part, okay? Go this way. So I've heard that meats have different protein or different things inside them that uh, vegetables or fruits do. And so when you eat meat, you gain more protein per se to build more muscle or stuff like that. Right. 
So, so yeah, I'll, are, I'll tell you about that. So meat has all, proteins are mil, made of amino acids. Okay, there's a certain number of essential amino acids. Meat and eggs have all of that, also dairy. Quinoa, the grain, has all of that too. Most plants don't. But if you eat beans and rice, you got the whole combination. So a vegetarian diet that really requires that you eat more than one thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Now there are also vegan athletes, there's vegan bodybuilders, they're getting plenty of protein, right. So that, that's a common misconception is that you have to eat meat to get the protein you need. Mm. If you have a vegetarian diet, especially if you have a vegan diet, you have to carefully choose your foods too. And this is where consulting a professional, a registered dietitian nutritionist, and we have a lot of those that study here and that practice here. Also reading, you can read and find out about that too. So if you became a vegan, eating beans and rice would give you the same protein. Would they give you a good amount uh, uh, of the same, just like eating meat? Or would it require more? Meat in terms of would you require more protein? You might require slightly more protein because your body has to break down plant cells to, to digest or to get the protein, but that's not a big bar, okay? You'd be just fine. So don't make your choice you know, based on whether you think you, you need it to be an athlete or to build muscle. You can build lots of muscle with plants. Okay, so go, um, go Google vegan athletes, you know, and I mean, there's, of course, you probably find some people that are just kind of way out there in terms of promoting their lifestyle, but, you know, it does work. It does work. There's lots of ways. One pound of nuts, how, much, how many grams of protein would you take in? Oh, man, I don't have my, <laughs> I don't have my nut calculator here. Um, <laughs> and a pound, you mean like in a day? A pound in a day? Just a pound of nuts. Yeah. You know, I think a handful a day, well, I, I don't know the answer to that. But, you know, nuts and seeds, like pumpkin seeds, uh, sunflower seeds, those are great sources, not only protein, but of minerals and other things too. So I guess they're still rich in proteins and minerals. They're very rich in protein, but also healthy oils too. So if you squeeze the nuts, you get oil, right? I, if you just eat the nuts, you get it too. You and get so peanut butter and almond butter. Peanut butter is great too, yeah. <laughs> so those are squeezed peanuts. Um, you didn't talk too much about ideas about cutting food waste or throwing away food. How do you, are, are people studying that? Are there more nuanced? You know, people are studying that. I don't know very much about it. So I, I've seen charts of basically the whole chain from, from field, you know, field processing, food processing, food storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I know just from reading is that most of the waste in the U.S. and in developed countries come from consumers throwing it away. So whatever you can do in your own food preparation, um, planning meals, uh, saving leftovers, etc. cetera. Um, restaurants have a huge issue with throwing away food. Um, in developing countries, it's more an issue on the other end of trying to get the food from the field uh, before it spoils, uh, to process it, to get it to market. You know. But I'm sorry, I don't know other details on that. That could be a whole science unwrap talk. Yeah, you know, so if anyone has, does anyone have ideas on that? Food waste? Any ways that you've cut your food waste? Hi, Dr. Hunger. Hello. Good to see you. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. Uh, Could you repeat the question so we can Sure. 
Uh, I, I recently heard that uh, one of the European countries made it illegal for grocery stores to throw away food, and they're now uh, donating it to underprivileged people. And I was wondering if you've heard of that. No, I hadn't. But that uh, you know, having incentives to do that, um, yeah, that's a great, great idea. Those Europeans. Right? That's why they live longer than the last ride. Hi. Hi. Um, I was curious. Um, I do think we all need to eat more fruits and veggies, but I was wondering how um, mass harvesting or industrial harvesting affects the soil. How mass harvesting affects the soil. Yeah. Well, if it's not regenerated, you know, I'm not an agricultural specialist. There's some range scientists and others that I saw here, but um, yeah, it depletes. Soils have been depleted. And thus, the nutritional, the productivity has declined. The nutritional content of fruits and vegetables has often declined. One issue with increasing levels of CO2 is that plants grow faster. And that plants grow faster have lower levels of iron and of zinc. And this is of serious concern, particularly in areas where those are in short supply. Yeah. So a lot of processes do that. Uh, regenerative agriculture is the whole field about trying to restore soil health. Okay, so part of that is building carbon in the soil, building microorganisms, building the bacteria, building the fungus, you know, making soil you know, deeper and healthier. Okay. Time for one more. You're gonna make me work. Tell you what, this is a uh, a crowdsourced and team effort. Are you a good toss? Maybe you can bounce it off yeah. dirt, Ready? Professor yeah. Vanderwerk's Ready? head. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Ready? This is a long pass over here, right? Yep. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, I'm asking this question on behalf of my three-year-old. As soon as he looked at that paper, he said, Mom, there's no ice cream. And <laughs> oh, wait, there's that little tiny round thing, that, you know, that's dairy, you know. Oh, right. Okay. Well, so I, I was wondering if there were any trends related to desserts or sweets in those blue zones that you were talking about. Should there, is it just off the menu or are there allowances? No. Yeah, I really mean to emphasize that the blue zone diets are going away. Okay, the young kids in Okinawa are eating McDonald's food, you know, so... You know, there's a globalization of, you know, junk food and fast food. And so, you know, we're kind of looking at these disappearing traditional diets. But in other areas, they're coming back. There are, there's a whole group of Native American chefs and food promoters. Not, well, not food promoters. People that are rediscovering the diverse diets of their ancestors. You know, I've had some of them come and talk in my class. Uh, here in uh, Cache Valley, in northern Cache Valley, the Shoshone are looking at uh, Darren Perry, the head of the uh, leader of the Shoshone, uh, has written a book and has information from his grandmother about plants in, in the area here. So there's a resurgence in some areas, but globally things are looking not, are, are going in the other direction. Okay. Thank you. And I, I th want to thank Dr. Munger. I think that'll be the last of the, the large group questions. If, if Dr. Munger has the energy, I think he'll be at the front to take some questions yeah. and have them. Let's give Ron Munger a big hand.